All right, good afternoon and welcome to the UCLA Pritzker Center's forum on COVID-19, the vaccine and foster care. We are offering this talk in Spanish. Speakers, we ask that you speak slowly and one at a time to capture the translation. I'm now going to ask our student assistant floor to please announce and add instructions to the chat for the Spanish call line. Buenas tardes. Si necesita asistencia en español, contamos con una llamada en vivo donde traducimos toda la información de esta videollamada. Las instrucciones para esta llamada son las siguientes. Llame al número 605-313-4434 y después ingrese el código 829406 y agregaré estas instrucciones en el chat. Gracias. Thank you so much, Flor. Good afternoon. My name is Taylor Dudley. I'm the administrative director for the UCLA Pritzker Center, and I'm pleased to moderate this event today with Dr. Tyrone Howard, the center's co-director and director of the UCLA Blackmail Institute and the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools. We are also joined by our program coordinator, Ruby Tucker, and our students, Taylor Thaxton, Mariam Khan, Brittany Hun, and Flor Ramirez. Some logistics before we begin. This event, is hosted in partnership with the Venice Family Clinic and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. We are thankful to the Association of Community Human Services, excuse me, Community Human Service Agencies for its feedback in planning this event and to the LA County Department of Public Health for providing critical insights on the content. For those who submitted questions in advance, we have incorporated answers into the presentation. After this event, we will provide a handout with additional insights. We are taking questions throughout the session and we'll answer some of them at the end of the panel. Please utilize the Q&A function on Zoom for questions or ask the Spanish moderator. This talk will be posted on our YouTube channel and Twitter account at UCLA Pritzker next week. A note on geography. We are based at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. Most of our work revolves around the LA County child welfare system. Understanding people are joining us from across the United States we will do our best to share information that is relevant to all, but please bear in mind local regulations on the vaccine and its distribution. With that in mind, we invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Please feel free to share your organization, your role, and why you're joining this session. Finally, as a land grant institution, the UCLA Pritzker Center acknowledges our presence, digital, virtual, or otherwise, on the traditional, ancestral, and unheeded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people. We pay respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taylor. First and foremost, thank you for joining us. My name is Tyrone Howard. As Taylor mentioned, I am the co-director of the UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families, as well as the UCLA Black Male Institute and the Center for the Transformation of Schools. This conversation is timely. This conversation is relevant. This conversation is desperately needed. Children and families of color comprise a significant majority of individuals involved in the LA County child welfare system. Many of these children and families are underserved, oftentimes over surveilled and living in poverty. The impact of the pandemic physically, emotionally and educationally cannot be overstated enough. Let us be clear with these facts in mind, questions and doubts concerning the future, especially as related to the vaccine are understandable. To help address these concerns, our esteemed panel today will help us in an immense number of ways by one, helping us to organize a framework around COVID-19 that accounts for the history of medical racism and the pandemic's harsh impact on communities of color. Second, we'll explore child welfare, foster care, and the unique dilemmas, challenges, questions, and concerns that are facing caregivers, social workers, and others directly involved with children and families. Thank you, Dr. Howard. My name is Taylor Thaxton. As a second year medical student in the Drew UCLA program and a volunteer member of the UCLA Pritzker Center's student team, I'm in please, I am pleased to introduce our panelists. Professor Lucas Wright serves as an assistant professor, vice chair of the Department of Preventative and Social Medicine and co-chair of the Division of Community Engagement at the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. Professor Wright is the lead on the outreach strategy team at CDU for the Coronavirus Prevention Network. She is a member of the Stop COVID-19 Work Group at UCLA Lundquist and the National COVID-19 Resilience Network. Dr. Keith C. Norris, Professor and Executive Vice Chair for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in the UCLA Department of Medicine, 
He is pre presently co he presently <laughs> presently co leads an NIH grant called the COVID-19 California Alliance, Stop COVID-19 California, a network of community and academic partnerships across the state to improve COVID-19 knowledge, therapeutic trials, and vaccine participation of all Californians with a focus on marginalized populations. Dr. Michael Mensa is currently co-chief resident at UCLA Department of Psychiatry at Seminole Institute of Neuroscience and co-editor of the Race and Mental Health Equity column in Psychiatric Services. Born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, he received his BA in Philosophy and African American Studies at Princeton University, then attended the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. During medical school, he co-founded the UCSF chapter of White Coats for Black Lives and won a Zuckerman Fellowship to earn his MPH from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you so much, Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariam Khan, and I am a second year medical student at UCLA and a volunteer at the UCLA Pritzker Center's um, team. I'm pleased to introduce the rest of our panel. Dr. Michelle Aguilar is a pediatrician at the Venice Family Clinic. Prior to joining the Venice Family Clinic, she was a medical director at a federally qualified health center in South Los Angeles. She completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Southern California and earned her medical degree at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, where she also completed her residency in pediatrics. A native of Los Angeles, Dr. Aguilar has always been dedicated to working with medically underserved patient populations. Dr. Omai Garner is an associate clinical professor and a director of clinical microbiology in the UCLA Health System. He received his PhD in the UC from UC San Diego in biomedical sciences. He was a postdoctoral clinical microbiology fellow in the Department of Pathology at UCLA and a former McNair scholar. Dr. Garner is board certified by the American Board of Medical Microbiology. Dr. Garner's research focuses on novel point of care devices for infectious disease diagnosis in the developing world. He also serves as the chairman of the board for the Social Justice Learning Institute of Inglewood, California. Dr. Tatiana Galane works for LA County as a physician specialist for children in foster care at the Hub Clinic at Olive Medical Center in Selmer and as a general pediatrician at High Desert Regional Center in Lancaster. She has practiced general pediatrics in Los Angeles for the last five years and graduated from pediatric residency at UCLA. Thank you for the introductions, Mariam and Taylor. Uh, as you can see, we have an incredible group of amazing experts here. And at this time, I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Michael Mensa. Dr. Mensa will open our presentation with a historical look at medical racism and the harsh impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and provide some context for our discussion today. Dr. Mensa, the screen is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Howard. I really appreciate it. Um, so first off, thank you all for coming to this event. I think it's incredibly important that we talk about this and, and, and talk about it in, in frank terms. And frankly speaking, you know, um, our history um, as a nation uh, regarding racism, especially medical racism, has been, you know, uh, full of tragedy and full of uh, atrocity. I mean, you can start with experimentation on and, and state peoples and decimation of, 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 of Native American uh, folks and, and, and go all the way through to Tuskegee and then thereafter, um, you know, segregated health care. Um, and all those things are, are incredibly impactful on how we as people of color see the medical field today. You know, it's, it's really hard to trust um, medicine um, that has, you know, so often um, undermine the, 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 the distrust or so distrust among us um, through how they've treated our ancestors. And um, even today, looking at how the, you know, the government has acted in our lifetimes through um, you know, uh, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, um, Donald Trump, uh, you know, there's just a lot of, of evidence there to say, hey, you know, there's, why should I trust the government? Why should I trust medicine? 
um, with regard to this vaccine and, and, and COVID-19 and all these mandates? Do they, do they care about me? Do they care about us? What are they trying to do? Um, and, you know, I acknowledge all those things. I, I believe all those things. I, I, I steadfastly believe that, you know, that we have lots of reasons to distrust the government. We have lots of reasons to distrust the medical field because they, they haven't done right by us in all, in all facets. I also believe, you know, in, in science, and I think the, the, the uh, incredible work that uh, some of the many scientists have done to cultivate this vaccine have been really due to and motivated by um, a, a, hum, a shared humanity, a shared cause. And that's really what I wanna, wanna stress here. Um, in other situations in the past with re regard to atrocities, um, with regard to disease, um, Experimentation was done, and it was it was really unfounded and, and uncalled for. Um, but there wasn't a shared fate, you know. There wasn't a shared reason um, to to experiment. It, it seemed to be um, it wasn't this pandemic situation where everybody's at stake, where everybody's at risk. Um, and I think that's that's one of the most important parts of. of the history and what's, what our history can really tell us is that as much as we distrust the government and, and what it can and cannot do, um, we're in the same, but we're all in the same boat in terms of the, the COVID vaccines, COVID threat, as well as the COVID vaccine. Um, if the, this thing, if the COVID vaccine works, which it does, um, we're going to be able to get back to life as it was before and and, and go out, see our family, see our friends, and and and, and be um, engaged, and and uh, really actively uh, looking at uh, our own families, and, and and going back to work. And if not, then you know we're going to continue to have these uh, Zoom meetings, which are very good, but are also um, not ideal. And so, you know, I I think that's that's one thing I could say. I can also say as as a, as a black doctor myself. Um, getting the vaccine last year um, and having felt no ill effects from it, I can tell you that it's really changed my perspective on this on this illness, um, especially uh, you know considering the history that has happened in, in medicine. I, I can tell you that it's, it's opened my eyes um, to where distrust is is helpful. And, and it's good to be skeptical of, of providers and, 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 and advocate for yourself and make sure that that's happening. But also um, to know that, you know, medicine, despite its, you know, despite providers, some providers being being racist and the system being racist does have things to offer. And so that's, that's really my point with the history is that as m there's been a lot of racism in, in the history of, of medicine. And also there's been a lot of advancements in medicine that are helpful and have saved lives. You know, you could talk about penicillin, you could talk about, um, you know, surgery, you could talk about advancements everywhere. And I think distrust of the government can exist alongside taking advantage of those advancements. So thank you, I appreciate, I appreciate being here and I'm happy to, to take any and all uh, inquiries after the, the um, panel portion. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I think you you really helped to outline the the context here in terms of the mistrust, the history of racism. And we've even seen some data recently about the, the, the lower rates at which black and brown communities are even getting vaccinated because of this mistrust. And so I think it's important to dispel some of the myths to understand some of the context behind why that fear is what it is. So I want to move now, if I can, to Dr. Aziza Lucas Wright. And Dr. Lucas Wright, you've been a leader in the community for a long time. You have been connected to people and you hear lots of various things from, from folks in the community. Can you give a little bit of insight on what you're hearing in the community from folks? And more importantly, what you're hearing from families involved in foster care and how these issues are being addressed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Thaxton. Uh, so the behaviors we are seeing uh, with children in foster care are largely shaped and influenced by uh, child welfare apartheid. African-American children followed by Latinx children are disproportionately removed from their homes and sometimes never to return with African-American children often uh, never to return uh, to the home again and moving from foster care straight, it's a pipeline straight into 
a homelessness. So my response uh, is today is going to be from the safety net partnerships uh, who work with uh, who I work with and who care for uh, youth in out of home placement. Uh, this includes outreach workers from South Central Prevention Coalition uh, and four group homes that uh, uh, that I was uh, uh, a privilege to speak with administrative staff, clinical staff, and direct care staff. Unfortunately, a lot of minors uh, there uh, for a lot of minors there is no biological connection. Therefore, the foster care sites are a pr their primary circle of support. So we know that there are times when it is absolutely needed, but there still remains this disproportionate. Uh, removal from homes. So I'm going to ask if, uh, let's see, I have screen share privileges. Oh, oh, it's up. Okay, wonderful. So uh, let me begin. So youth who appear, youth appeared to not understand or believe in the severity of, of the pandemic uh, resulting in 90% uh, of minors did not follow guidelines for keeping themselves and others safe. Uh, they refused to wear masks, refused to wash hands frequently. And I think I think that not only because they didn't understand the pandemic, uh, they have been removed from place of, of, of origin. They have little or no control over what happens in their lives. If you were raised in a family with bookends, a mommy and a dad, you know you can go to one of them or both and negotiate for something. You can ask for something and if they say no once, you go back back again. But have my myself being a, a child that was uh, put in out of home placement with relatives, but still is out of home placement, when you're told no, no means no, and you there is no room, there's no grace, there's nothing there that allows you to sort of find your way and have begin to e exercise any kind of, of self-control and any kind of, of uh, sense of any kind of power uh, in those kinds of environments. So I think that it's, it's a matter uh, often too, a matter of kids saying, look, I'm going to establish power someplace. Uh, minors continue to AWOL at very high rates and did not take precautions to protect others once they returned, if they returned at all. And minors refused to, 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 particip to participate in taking the test, the CV test uh, to check their status. And, and this happened if one day that they came to do tests and then uh, some, the, if it was gonna happen the next day, there was this sort of like mass AWOLing. Next slide. Also minors are expected to try to view the group home as a, um, <clears throat> it's, a it's a clinical milieu, but it's also a, a, a expected to be viewed as a home-like environment. And so they say they treat it like one. They say families don't wear masks inside their homes and nor do they social distance. So they uh, said that th this was one of the reasons why people in their own home and other homes don't do it. So why do we have to do it? Uh, after numerous breakouts within the homes, the minors were though more willing to wear the masks but still it didn't come up to the level that was, was uh, uh, optimum. And then minors refused to participate in the clinical uh, CV testing to check their status and may, may, and may have the same opinions regarding the vaccines once that begins to, to uh, be an option or something that is requested of them. So the discussions regarding the vaccine, so there, there were uh, often pushbacks, uh, leaving the kids were leaving the house when minors knew testing was gonna occur, uh, they would they would again they would would uh, a wall. So we're expecting that that could very well happen regarding the vaccines. It is uh, it is recommended by some of the group home uh, administration that a one injection required vaccine has the best chance of being accepted by the minors, and that due to the high a wall. Waiting for this high a wall. Excuse me. The, Chats uh, off, keep coming up. Uh, behaviors of late. The one injection required vaccine is recommended again by the group home staff. That's that might be the best uh, possibility of it uh, uh, being uh, uh, accepted and it, and it being able to work. Next slide. And that's it. So well, well, at, we're I think we're asking folk to hold their questions until the end. Thank you very much. That's very helpful, Dr. Lucas. I think that as Dr. Mensa laid out these issues of mistrust, racism, which are uh, in place in the medical system are also in place in our child welfare system. 
And so for a lot of our youth where issues of empowerment and choice come into play, sometimes the decisions that are made may not always be in their best interest from a health standpoint. So that data is really powerful and quite illuminating. Thank you for sharing that. So now these concerns are obviously valid and understandable. Uh, it makes sense to understand why the community would have questions, especially about the vaccine. There's lots of mistrust, lots of misinformation. So to help us understand this a bit better, uh, let's turn it over to Dr. Omai Garner to speak about the vaccine. Uh, and if you can talk about not just the vaccine in general, but how it was developed, how it works, and most importantly, whether or not it's okay just to get one dose. Dr. Garner? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I wanna thank the group for coming together today. I wanna thank Dr. Howard. And uh, you should have questions about this. Right? This is a brand new vaccine. This is a brand new disease. And I think there's been some question shaming that's been going on. We should absolutely have questions to be able to educate ourselves best, most properly to understand the taking of the vaccine and the protection from this uh, disease, this horrible disease. And so I wanna give some basics on the vaccine itself. These things are very new, especially from an mRNA vaccine perspective. But I wanna start with this concept of protective immunity. This is this idea that your immune system has memory. So what that means is when you get an infectious disease, let's say you encounter a virus, after fighting that virus, your body produces antibodies. These antibodies, they're in your bloodstream, and they give you protection if you encounter the disease the second time. And in fact, they're so efficient at that protection that if you get that disease the second time, you won't have any symptoms. So it's beautiful that protective immunity exists. The challenge is that you have to get the disease the first time. And what we've learned with COVID-19, especially in its disproportional effect amongst communities of color, 500,000 people or almost 500,000 people at this point have died in their first interaction with COVID-19, not even getting the chance to build protective immunity. So the idea with the vaccine is how do we get around giving someone the disease, but create protective immunity? And the way that you can do that with COVID-19 is you can give the body a small piece of the COVID-19 virus and that piece will produce protective immunity. That piece is called the spike protein. You may have heard about this spike protein in the media. It's something that's found on the outside of the virus that actually helps the virus to infect in a cell. So if you have antibodies that bind to that spike protein, you can efficiently stop the virus from causing disease. Now, some vaccines that are gonna come out are based on that protein itself, but this is an mRNA vaccine. So let's pick apart exactly what that means. Viruses are composed of two different pieces. There's the proteins that are found on the outside of the virus and that compose the virus. And you can really think of these as the action arm of the virus. They allow infection, they allow replication. But the virus also has a genome. These are the genetic instructions to be able to make the virus and that's held in the form of what's called RNA. Now RNA for the virus makes the whole virus, but the mRNA just for the spike protein, and this is only 10% of the genomic instructions can just make the spike protein itself. So this is how our mRNA vaccines actually work. You take that small piece of mRNA, just the genetic instructions to make the spike protein, and you inject that into the arm. The cells that are there, they pick up that mRNA and they make spike protein. Now they can't make the whole virus. And this is a question that comes up a lot. Can the mRNA vaccine actually give you the virus? Remember, it's only 10% of that genetic code. That spike protein is then made by the cells that are in your arm and presented to your immune system. Your immune system sees that spike protein and creates that protective immunity downstream then being able to protect you against the disease. Now, this happened fast, right? It went from the creation of the mRNA vaccine to approval in a short amount of time. The reason is because this is not a new technology. Yes, new to be approved for a vaccine, but mRNAs for therapeutics have actually been explored for the last 20 or 30 years. And if you'll remember the SARS virus, the 2003 SARS pandemic, there was an mRNA vaccine being made for that disease, but then the disease went away. So if the disease goes away, you don't need to have a vaccine. Vaccines are only worthy of production for diseases like COVID-19 that are global pandemics. So this is not doing technology. This is technology that's been explored by scientists for a long time, it's just new to be approved as a vaccine. Because again, for approval, we need a vaccine that works and a disease that actually deserves global vaccination. So these two things have come together for COVID-19 specifically, and it's why we have this wonderfully effective vaccine. And the effectiveness, 
I believe Dr. Norris is going to mention um, next. Wow, Dr. Garner, I heard a lot about this vaccine, but what you just gave us there in five minutes was incredibly insightful. I'm now learning about protective immunity and genomic instructions and mRNAs and spike protein. That was very, very insightful. So quick question before we move on, I wanna ask you. So what does that mean then for someone who's gotten the vaccine, right? After they get the vaccine, are masks still required? Is social distancing still necessary? Why or why not? That's a great question. So to begin that, I wanna talk about the doses, right? There are two doses for the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. The reason there are two doses is because your immune system needs to learn to make the right set of antibodies. And it does that most efficiently after the second dose. So the question comes up a lot, well, can I just take one dose? Well, in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, the protection is not as good if you just take one dose. It was studied at two doses, and that's where people were shown to have protective immunity. Now, in the future, there will be more vaccines. We already have a Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's on its way to being approved, and that's going to be one dose. In that setting, it's been studied, and that one dose is effective to produce protective immunity. So again, whether it's a two-dose series or a one-dose series, it's really about the measurement of protective immunity and protection against the disease. And the vaccines have various ways of being able to produce that protective immunity. Now, the second question, which Dr. Howard mentioned, which is very important, is after you get the vaccine, so I've been vaccinated like Dr. Mensa, like a lot of us on the call, you know, can I just run around with my mask off now? So interesting in the vaccine studies, what they studied is whether or not you get sick. So the vaccines are very good at stopping you from getting sick with COVID-19. What they did study is whether I can hold the virus in my upper respiratory area and bring it to my loved ones and drop it off to them. That's being studied now, but we don't know the answer to that. So example, my 81-year-old father, I'm happy to say, in Wisconsin, he's getting vaccinated. He's going to get his second dose next week. But right now, he would still be at risk. So if I went home, I'm vaccinated, but if I carried some virus to him, potentially he could get sick. So until we know that you can't carry the virus around while vaccinated, we are still suggesting, of course, masks and social distancing. But as more and more of the population gets vaccinated and more and more of the disease comes down, we'll start to see the lifting of those restrictions and we can rely on the CDC to make those recommendations. Very illuminating. So I need to tell my mother who got her first vaccine last week that she still needs to mask up and she still needs to social distance. So thank you so much, Dr. Garner. Very insightful, very helpful. And I will call mom right after we finish this conversation. <laughs> so let's continue on. Um, I want to move on. So understanding the vaccine and its reach is really helpful. But Dr. Norris, I want to bring you in here if I can. Uh, you have a lot of insight about what went into the trials for the vaccine in the first place. And this is important because it speaks to Dr. Mintz's point about some of the concerns and the, the mistrust and the fear that a lot of uh, communities of color, in particular Black folks, have about the vaccine. So can you outline a little bit more about the clinical, the clinical trial? And then can you also talk about the side effects of the vaccine and whether those side effects are worse in communities of color, in particular for Black and Latinx communities? And does the effectiveness or side effect depend on whether or not you got the Moderna or you got the Pfizer or if it's the new Johnson & Johnson. Enlighten us if you can about the, about the vaccine and the great, trial. Great questions. Pleasure to be here. Great questions. And um, uh, yeah, so the clinical trials itself, there was a lot of concern when they started. So clinical trials, we have several phases. You have preclinical trials and then you have, we have early clinical trial phases where people, where there's a small number of people and they test to make sure it's safe and they wanna find out what the right dose is that they should be using. And then they increase and they'll go to a second or third phase where they study more people. And that's where, you, where there may be five, 10,000 people in the Moderna and Pfizer study, there were actually 30,000 plus in each of those studies. And, early, and one issue is, well, were there people of color in the study, right? How do I know it works for people of color? And early on, there were not a lot of people of color in the studies, but then there was a big push. And by the end of the study, uh, both of these trials had about 30, 35% people of color. So very equal representation to society. And what we saw is the, effic the effectiveness of the vaccine was the same in people of color as it was in their white peers. 
So that's the first thing. And the second, so when we wanna see how effective it is and does that vary by race, ethnicity? And that seems to be the same. Then they looked at the side effects and the side effects tend to be uh, pain at the injection site or some swelling, uh, muscle aches, feeling tired, headaches. Some people have fever and chills. They feel like they have the flu and they'll be sick for a day or two. There was no difference in side effects between uh, racial ethnic groups. Everybody got a lot of them. So, so the side effects are pretty common, right? Um, and they, they're particularly common after the second vaccine, after the second dose of the vaccine and in younger individuals. And that's thought to be due to, as Dr. Garner said, you get the first vaccine and now your body's starting to learn about um, this virus and, and, and the immune system's learning what's going on. When you get your second dose, now it's already seen it. So the reaction tends to be bigger the second time. At least that's the thought that the reaction is bigger the second time and that younger people have a more, have a stronger immune system. And so we see more side effects after the second vaccine. And it happens to be more likely to happen with Moderna than with Pfizer, but not a big difference, right? It's only gonna be a couple of days and then you're okay. It's a little more than if you have the flu vaccine, not as much as if we see people with um, shingles vaccine. So, so that sort of covers those. I would, one thing that is important for people who have concerns about the vaccination for the side effects is that for every million vaccinations, there are about two or three serious reactions and one or two may require hospitalization. And there have been some reports of potential deaths and, and people are looking to see, was that related to the a side effect of the vaccine or was that something else? So that's for every million, one to two serious hospitalizations. For every million COVID infections, rather than one to two hospitalizations, there are 15,000 deaths and 70,000 people being hospitalized. So that's the difference, right? For every million vaccinations, there's one or two side effects. For every million cases of COVID, there are 15,000 deaths, 70,000 hospitalizations. And on this Zoom today, when we get finished talking about it, another 100 people may have died and another 500 may have been hospitalized. Wow, that's a lot. That's I'm a curious, lot. Dr. Norris, one of the questions that has come up is about uh, the vaccination and its effects on fertility and, and, and for women who are pregnant, because there are lots of things that we don't know from some of the trials about whether or not women who are pregnant are expecting. Can you speak to that at all? Sure. I, I'll speak to it. So as you said, there's not a lot known about it, but there does not appear to be any impact on fertility for anybody. Uh, it wasn't strategically studied in pregnancy, but during the studies, there were a fair number of individuals who became pregnant. Mm -hmm. And there was no evidence of any untoward effects in, in, in women who became pregnant. What we do know is that women who are pregnant, if they get a COVID infection, they tend to have a much more severe case and be at even greater risk. So because of that, unless there's some other reason why not, most people would recommend to go ahead and get vaccinated if you're pregnant or you're considering pregnancy. And it does not appear to be any effect for men or women as it relates to fertility. And one last question on this before we move in. We still don't know much about the effects of the, the vaccine on children. That's still sort right. of being tested. Is that accurate? Yes. So the, the Pfizer trial included individuals down to 16 years of age. So we have just at that top end, you know, the older children, 16, 17, years. Uh, the Moderna did not. And so what they're getting ready to do next is to actually do studies in children to, to get the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. Very insightful. Thank you so much, Dr. Norris. Can't say how much we appreciate the work that you're doing here. So let's move on because your information about vaccine and clinical trials are so vital here uh, and really informative. Uh, but there's still lots of questions. And in particular here in Los Angeles County, uh, there's been some really devastating data that's come out around the effects of COVID-19 on our Latinx communities, where some estimates of some data have shown that it's been a thousand times higher in terms of infection and death rates compared to whites. And so there's a need to really 
have a, a hard conversation about sort of the impact of race uh, with the vaccine and in particular with the Latinx community. So with that, I wanna bring in Dr. Michelle Aguilar. Uh, Dr. Aguilar, can you talk to us about some of the, the concerns of, of the virus, the vaccine with uh, Latinx families and also immigrant families in general? Because there's lots of information about can individuals who, for example, who might be undocumented, can they get the vaccine? Uh, there's concerns about underrepresentation in health rec in the health uh, workforce con uh, capacity. Uh, can you say more about just how this issue is playing out in many Latinx communities? Certainly, um, and thank you for having me here. Um, so, as you said, um, it is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected our communities of color, which has further exacerbated health disparities. Latinx people make up 39% of the population in California and account for 55% of COVID-19 cases and 46% of COVID-19 related deaths. 64% of pediatric COVID-19 cases in California are in Latinx children. So this state, devastating data demonstrates how Latinx people are more likely to be in high-risk environments working essential service jobs with lack of paid sick leave lack of health insurance, and a higher likelihood of living in multi-generational homes. And these are the families and people who need the vaccine. We need to support our communities of color by improving access to health care and mental health services in order to keep them healthy, manage their chronic health conditions, and care for them during an acute illness. Support them as they are grieving and facing toxic stress talking to them about the vaccine and its safety and why we recommend it. Fear and mistrust has also led to delays in seeking medical care for many of our patients. So these delays in, in care has led to poorly controlled chronic health conditions. Um, we've been seeing increased obesity rates, depression, anxiety from the social isolation, um, among others. Um, the lack of technology to support um, telehealth visits has been another barrier for communities, which is why telephonic care has been so important for our patients. Continued support for telephonic health care services beyond the pandemic is essential to address health inequities. And we've seen it with sort of the, the lack of access to vaccines in this community because it's mostly been through um, uh, accessing um, the public health websites and scheduling appointments. Latinx immigrant families with limited English proficiency frequently face additional barriers to care. Um, studies have shown patient provider language discordance contributes to mistrust and poor, poor health outcomes. Um, it is important that the healthcare workforce represents the diversity of the communities we serve. Beyond language concordance, racial and ethnic concordance between patients and providers helps build the trust and relationship necessary to begin to address the inequities our communities face. I've started conversations with my patients and their families about the vaccine. I've had these conversations with my own families talking about the vaccine and its safety. They are hesitant, they are worried, they, they don't wanna become ill, they don't wanna become another statistic. Improving access to the vaccine for our most vulnerable communities and our most affected communities is also important. And as we've mentioned earlier, despite being disproportionately affected by the pandemic, immunization rates among communities of color are extremely low. Um, it is a moral and public health imperative to ensure that all individuals residing in the United States, regardless of immigration status, have access to the COVID-19 vaccine once eligible under public, local public health guidelines. Um, so the vaccine is and will be available to, to all people. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar, that's helpful. Um, the more we help to uncover the myths and help to create the uh, pathways of accessibility will make a big difference. So I wanna see if I can pivot because I spend a lot of time in schools talking to superintendents and principals. And one of the big conversations of late has been around schools and reopening and the safety for children. So I wanna see if we can pivot here and bring in Dr. Tatiana uh, Galane here for a second, because this will only get better when families feel comfortable 
with the vaccine, that they feel safe about the vaccine. And there's still lots of questions about the vaccine and whether children can get it. So I mentioned this to Dr. Norris briefly, but I wanna come to you, Dr. Galane, and see if you can help us get some further clarity here, right? Uh, And speak to the issues that we should be thinking about when it comes to kids and the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So um, again, you know, I'm super grateful to be here and I really appreciate the invitation. And I'm so glad that we're talking about kids, right? So when this pandemic hit, everyone just kind of went into emergency mode. And obviously we're talking about those who were at highest risk and most affected in terms of morbidity and mortality for this virus. Um, But it sounds like for like a lot of times in health that pediatrics kind of falls to the wayside or is an afterthought in a lot of sense. Um, and I, I find it's I find it pretty funny that in this pandemic, you know, kind of earlier on the concerns were, well, what about the kids? They're not going to wear their masks and it's going to be such a challenge. And I actually find adults having a much harder time following guidelines than kids. Our kids have been phenomenal through all of this. So I have to apply to our young generation for um, their resilience and their courage, their bravery, and just powering through while we try to figure out what to do for them. You know, the reality is, is that for the US population, children make up about 24% of our population. That's a quarter of our US population. So it's actually incredibly important, not only for our protective immunity, our herd immunity that we talk about, that we incorporate our um, pediatric population in this conversation uh, for all of us. And when we talk about kids, there's a couple of things. So it makes sense that from a national perspective, we were looking at how do we create a vaccine to protect our most vulnerable populations, which we found as we're learning about this virus tended to be the older generations. Um, For our children's sake, we haven't actually had the vaccine trials just yet. All of our vaccine trials, as mentioned, have been uh, with adults, those over at least over the age of 21. Um, and so we're actually having clinical trials going on right now that are occurring. Um, they're occurring for children un- above the age of 12. Um, and so we are hoping to get more data about the um, efficacy and any potential side effects, ideally by this summer, summer of 2021. So that'll be very helpful. Uh, And then the question begets, well, then what about our younger kids less than 12 years old? Uh, Do they need to be vaccinated? What's going on with them? So what we know is that studies have shown that children, especially under the age of 10, for whatever reason, tend to have lower rates of transmission and overall much lower risk of severe uh, side effects and morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. still trying to figure out exactly why the case may be, but something about their immune systems tends to protect them from the sense of getting um, significant side effects and severe conditions from this virus, which is great in one hand, but in the other, like we said, if there's a quarter of our population that is um, under the age of 18, we need to incorporate them as well to get to that herd immunity. And so the goal is that after we get these trials and hopefully showing the same efficacy in our above 12 year old population, we can start administering trials for children under the age of 12 to see again, making sure that this vaccine is safe for them, these vaccines are safe for them as well. Um, The other thing to keep in mind is that for California State, I saw this a little bit in the chat, people were asking, um, when can we start giving this vaccine? So California State, as of March 15th, um, healthcare providers should be able to use their clinical judgment to administer the vaccines that have already been approved in those um, 16 years and up, um, assuming that they have pre-existing medical conditions that might put them in a high risk category. So think about those kids who Um, might have very severe asthma, medically complex children. Um, So again, that's based on the guidance of their providers. Uh, But after March 15th, we're really going to have to wait and hear back in terms of how these clinicals or trials are doing in the summer. So so this is helpful. Quick question. So we only can do better with the clinical trials when they're done. But are there not some concerns for parents who might say, I don't want my child to be in a clinical trial? What would you say or how would we help those parents to, to consider why it's helpful, especially in communities of color, once again, which is our focus here around just the, the safety, the trustworthiness of these approaches? What might you say to a parent or caregiver around that, Dr. Galang? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the thing is, is that, you know, for our country, it's really a team effort. And to be honest, when it comes to health, 
we have not always had a team mentality. Um, we really need to think about our community as a whole. So getting past that individual fear and really thinking about collectively, you know, our loved ones, right? Be they older generation or younger generation. Uh, this is an issue that all pediatricians face and essentially all, all physicians across all ages are facing is vaccine hesitancy, right? And so we talked about the very necessary and very real um, rooted in, in um, factual history of medical distrust among people of color in this nation, right? So of course there's gonna be a little bit of speculation when something new rolls out um, and you don't wanna be the guinea pig. You don't wanna be the first one to go out there. But the reality is, is that these vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective. And if we want that same care for ourselves then we should want that for our children as well. The other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, this pandemic, though it may not affect our children physically in the sense of severe conditions that lead them to the hospital, they are absolutely affecting them emotionally um, and in other physical manifestations. We are seeing higher rates of suicide um, in the ER among pediatric population, um, obesity, eating disorders, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and then also schooling too. A lot of kids are affected by being able to go to school or not attend school. So in a sense, coming back to that whole community mentality, um, protecting our children is also in a way when they go back to school, even though we know they don't transmit at higher rates, we want to protect our teachers, we want to protect our custodians, we want to protect our teacher assistants in school, um, it takes a real team effort for that. So, uh, you know, how do you phrase that in a one on one with parents and with caregivers, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, we need the small step from everybody um, to be as time efficient as possible so we can move forward. Uh, the longer that we delay this uh, herd immunity, the more we're hurting this next generation uh, in terms of their education and also comorbidities that are preventable right now by, by all doing our part. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. One last quick question because I want to turn over to get some questions from our guests. Dr. Ghislaine. Uh, our focus and one of our primary concerns in the UCLA Prisco Center are kids who are in foster care. Uh, what might you share, what could you offer about sort of the unique challenges and issues that kids in foster care face, especially when it comes to access for caregivers? Absolutely. So this is, you know, kind of my specialty. And I think that's why, you know, was brought into this conversation is that I see foster kids every day. Um, and a couple themes that I'm hearing is that, you know, from caregivers. One, caregivers, I got to give it up to our foster parents and our families because they are going above and beyond and extending their homes um, in very challenging and vulnerable situations for parents, right? Uh, and so what we want to do is they're obviously nervous too. You know, they're extending their home and their invitation, but I have, I have caregivers who have pre-existing health conditions who have had to be hospitalized and uh, they want some stability as well from their home. They're taking care of their own kids as well. So um, we want to protect them. So there's a lot of questions about what can we do for caregivers. Uh, as we know right now for um, foster parents, um, unless they, right now for California Department of sure. Public Health, unless they are, um, unless they have their own pre-existing medical conditions, there is no set uh, requirement at this time. Time, um, regardless of their age for the vaccine. So it's really up to them and speaking with their primary care providers to get the vaccine themselves. Um, and then the other thing is talking about med medical consent too. Um, so we have to, this is a very unique situation for our foster kids is that it's really the due diligence of the primary care providers, the pediatricians and the nurse practitioners um, to reach out to families and have a clear understanding who has medical consent for these foster kids. Is it the bio parents? If so, then you need to speak with the bio parents um, directly and make sure that they understand the pros and cons of, of this vaccine and that they are fully informed so they can give consent. Um, if they do not have those rights, then it's the foster parent. And so having those conversations, taking the extra time uh, to talk with them about that. And then also realizing for foster kids, um, situations change. They might not be staying in the same place, the same group home or the or even the same foster home during this pandemic. And so wherever they go, we want to make sure that they're prote protected along that journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Glane. So much valuable information. I'm going to turn it over to Taylor. Taylor, you want to pick up from here and we can get some questions from our guests. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our incredible panelists for your insights. Thank you uh, to Dr. Howard for moderating. We do have a number of questions from our guests 
And so the first one is, will the vaccine change my DNA or cause other long-term harm? And I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Garner. Wonderful, great question. You know, I think that again, this goes back to, we are using genomic material in the mRNA vaccine, so there can be some concern. And so when I mentioned the virus, I talked about its genomic instructions were held in RNA. Our genomic instructions are held within our cells in DNA, and that DNA is protected from the rest of the cell in a structure called the nucleus. You can think about it as a structure that protects our genetic material. So when the mRNA vaccine gets into the cell, it actually never goes into the nucleus. It doesn't even come anywhere in contact with our own DNA. And so because there's no interaction there, there's no chance of some potential changing to our DNA. And what's interesting about the mRNA, when it gets into a cell, it teaches that cell how to make the spike protein, and then it's disintegrated. And so it doesn't even stay around for very long. So all of that says there isn't the chance of some effect on our DNA that could lead to long-term problems. Another issue with this particular vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, is that it's not a live virus vaccine. So there are some vaccines like measles, that are live virus, you take a live virus, you beat it up a little bit and you give it to a person. Those types of vaccines can have long-term consequences in immune compromised patients. This vaccine is not like that. This vaccine, remember, just uses a small piece of that viral instruction to make the spike protein. So there aren't concerns from effects of a live virus either. Thank you so much, Dr. Garner. I want to turn it to Dr. Aguilar and Dr. Ghislaine. Um, there's a lot of questions about having children placed in the home if they are not vaccinated. Um, what can be done to reduce risk and what other considerations should we give, uh, especially to children in foster care and the ever-changing nature of their placement? Um, I mean, as we've been doing uh, previously, prior to the availability of the vaccine, continued screenings um, in place uh, for, for children who are going to be placed um, and for anyone who's symptomatic offering um, the testing needed to, you know, know uh, whether a child has been um, infected with COVID-19 and, and if they screen positive um, in, the, in the questionnaire. Um, but certainly um, moving forward, advocating for these um, high risk, um, you know, children and their caregivers. Um, so policies surrounding that um, to help support um, prioritization of these groups in, in getting the vaccine when available. Dr. Glenn, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's part of our team as the medical team and also all those that are involved at every level when it comes to foster care to uh, make sure to check in with these patients, right, and see how they're doing, how they're feeling. This is a scary time. You you know, most of us are looking to each other for guidance and for support. And so for we're like I said before, we're asking a lot of our kids. We have always asked a lot of our kids of color, and we are asking. We're not even asking. We're actually just telling people to just figure it out sometimes with our kids of color in foster care. And so really checking in with our patients, seeing how they're doing, how they're feeling. Do they understand? Do they have any other questions about what's going on? Um, one of the things that I'm seeing here at all of you, and I'm sure is true for all of our LA County uh, hub clinic sites are when we do identify someone that's in foster care or that's in transition between homes or group homes, we always make sure to screen them to see if if they have any COVID symptoms, um, to test them if appropriate, and then to give recommendations for either treatment or isolation. So that I know that for um, Department of Child Family Services, um, seeing if there needs to be an adequate isolation um, uh, living requirement, whether it be a, a subsidized Airbnb or something like that, that's age appropriate for those kids. Um, so they can complete their isolation, protect themselves, protect others that are in the group homes before returning. Thank you both for your insights there. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Aguilar, you addressed some of this previously, but a lot of our community has shared that they just don't see enough information about the vaccine in Spanish. And when they do, the information is confusing and it's not really written very well. 
Um, if members of the Spanish speaking community want to talk with someone about those concerns that they have for themselves or for their children, um, what should they do? Do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, so um, it's really important to continue communicating um, with uh, your primary care providers, right? Um, seeking access to care. I think I wanna emphasize this point um, that despite um, sort of the fears associated with coming into clinic and whatnot, there are other ways to be in touch and connect, stay connected with your clinician. So um, asking those questions, you've already have a relationship with your provider to help clarify some of this information. Obviously there is um, information in Spanish at the um, LA County Public Health website at, from the CDC website as well, which I will put on the, um, in the chat, but if, you know, a lot of this information can be confusing. So reaching out, um, stay connected with your primary care providers, your pediatricians, your doctors, and um, so that they can help uh, provide more information and clarify all these questions. If questions are good. It's, 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 we, we are here to answer them. So please reach out. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar. Uh, let's go to Dr. Garner. Uh, we hear a lot from the community that they don't take the flu shot. Uh, so why should they take this vaccine? How is this different? Yeah, you know, I think this comes from the beginning of the pandemic. When there was a new virus, right? SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 was a brand new disease. The only disease that we had to compare it to was flu. So we made that comparison, and there were actually quite a lot of policies that didn't serve us very well because of that early on comparison. But I just want to emphasize this virus is not influenza. It is way more dangerous. And one of the reasons we know it's more dangerous is it's more contagious. If you look at the number of people that have caught this virus, it has led to the number of people that have uh, had bad consequences, right? Either extended disease or dying. And I like to sort of talk about this from a virology perspective a little bit. So when you're sick and contagious with the flu, we can measure the amount of virus that you have kind of in your upper airway. And we do this for some of our tests. When you're sick and contagious with COVID-19, we can do the same thing. And on average, a person who is sick with COVID-19 has about 20 times more virus in their upper respiratory area than someone who's equivalently sick with the flu. And so it's just, it's not the same virus. I respect the fact that people may not, may choose to not get the flu shot, but we need to have everybody on board to be able to be protected against COVID-19 if we're going to reach herd immunity and really fight this devastating disease. So my answer is yes, even though we made some early comparisons, it's apples and oranges. And this is a completely different, much more dangerous virus. Thank you so much, Dr. Garner. Another question from our guests is, can I get the vaccine if I have diabetes, lupus, autoimmune, or other issues? And we'll turn that to Dr. Norris. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and for many of the other vaccines that we had previously, if there's an attenuated virus that's you know sort of weakened and you get that as part of the vaccine and your immune system's weak, then, then that could become a problem. And as Dr. Garner said, that's not the case here. So you're just getting a, a, just a little piece of the virus, but not the virus itself. So even if you have a somewhat weakened immune system from some other medical condition, then you're not at risk for getting the virus and having a problem. We do want to make, you do need to check with your doctor because we want you to have a decent working immune system, right? Because the, the goal of the vaccine is to be able to generate an immune response. So if it's so weakened because you're very sick, you've had chemotherapy recently, your diabetes is very out of control, then that probably is not a good time to get the vaccine. And you just need to check with your doctor to make sure he or she can tell you when is a good time to go ahead and get the vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Norris. Uh, maybe Dr. Mensa, would you mind building on that with respect to questions about like, I've got the vaccine, or I'm healthy, like why do I still need to wear a mask? We've talked about this a little bit, but we really wanna emphasize this point. It goes back to what Dr. Gardner was talking about. If you just because you get the vaccine doesn't mean you're, you're, you're not carrying the virus, right? So you care about the people around you, um, I, which I, I think all of you do. You wanna make sure that you're, 
you're, you're keeping them safe as well. You might be carrying the virus and not having any symptoms, but if you give it, give them the, the if you infect them with COVID, then, and they get sick, that's a terrible feeling that, you know, you've got somebody sick because you happen to be feeling better and got a vaccine. So number one is to protect other people. Um, and I think that the second reason is, you know, we want to get through this pandemic as quickly as possible. Right? When people get sick, it slows our ability to get through the pandemic. It burdens hospitals. It stops people from getting other procedures. And so really, I want to, I think all of us here want to be in a situation where we don't have to wear a mask and we don't have to have anxiety about not wearing a mask. I think the way to do that is to get your vaccine and, and wear a mask for now so that you don't get punished for it. I mean, you don't have to wear a mask for the next two years because, I mean, ultimately that's that's really the issue at hand um, is that the, the more we postpone wearing a mask, the more we resist wearing a mask, the longer we're going to have to wear one as a society. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. Uh, one more question from our guest um, to Dr. Uh, excuse me, Professor Lucas Wright. Um, can I wait and get the vaccine and just see, uh, excuse me, can I wait and not get the vaccine and just see how it works for other people? Doctor, uh, please. There is a cost for waiting. <laughs> if, you, if you sort of uh, uh, assign yourself, and I think black people can certainly relate to this. If you assign yourself to the back of the bus, uh, you might be participating in your own medical apartheid and 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 missing it, missing out. And I think that it's a it's a definitely a since we know since we know that uh, the the numbers are better on the side of vaccine. I, I I wouldn't play around with it. It's just not a good bet. I mean, uh, you you might not completely trust vaccines, but do you trust COVID at all? And so I I mean, it's like let's reason together about this. I I just think that. What are you waiting for? Uh, the, the numbers are looking extremely good on the side of vaccines. I just don't quite know what, what people are waiting for, waiting to see. So I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I just wouldn't as, 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 ascribe myself to the back of the bus on this one. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we're getting some questions about the trials among children and uh, are, if any of them are being done in LA. Can any of you speak to that? No. Uh, Dr. Norris or uh, Professor yeah, Lucas Wright? I was asking if you sure. could repeat that real quickly, please. Oh, questions about the trial uh, for children under 12. Uh, are any of them happening in Los Angeles? Do, uh, I can say, I don't know about any place else, but I do know that Drew is in discussions with Moderna uh, for trials with children and that it, those discussions are on their way. Um, I'm not quite sure who else is handling that. Dr. Norris, do you know? I, I know there are discussions, but I, I'm not sure if, I don't know if any have started yet. To my knowledge, no, but I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Great, thank you so much. Uh, another question um, about youth living in group homes. Uh, what is the risk for them uh, without underlying medical conditions, given the interaction between them and you know, others in the home? given their low uh, age and um, less risk associated with that age? Yeah. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily a whole lot of difference. Um, what we, again, what we've noticed in group homes that have the older children, the teens who, who AWOL, they certainly increase their own risk as well as the risk of the, uh, the, the direct service uh, um, care workers as, and administration. And, and the, the clinical folk that come in to, to work with them. So that they that sort of increases the risk. But for those group homes that have younger children and generally they try to find single parent homes or I'm sorry, single dwelling homes for uh, the younger ones. But in the situation where there are younger uh, the, the, and who tend not to uh, AWOL, it's, it's a little better. Thank because so the, the protocols are very strict and very high. They, uh, th those homes definitely get a lot of uh, scrutiny. They have tight protocols that are approved by uh, the um, LA County Department of Public Health. And um, their, 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 their protocol is, is pretty tight. So it's, it's pretty good for those who don't have 
the homes where kids tend to uh, AWOL. And we know that kids who are older, getting closer to aging out, tend to AWOL the most because they're the most anxious. They're the ones who, who are feeling like it's, it's uh, yet one more uh, home environment that's being taken away. And so they act out in that manner. Thank you so much, Professor. Anything further on that uh, from Dr. Ghislaine or Dr. Aguilar? Uh, I, I agree with everything that was just said, and I would just emphasize that um, as opposed to taking a little bit more of a lax approach that we need to be extra careful with these with these kids in these populations. And so um, I can appreciate the sentiment of, you know, treating, you know, using the experience of being in a group home as like a home. And so you don't want to wear a mask. But honestly, I would advise against that. I would say that for those that you are not immediate family with, um, it's probably in the best interest of each individual to wear masks as much as possible. Um, and it's just so hard with a lot of kids in transition from one place to another. They might be in a group home for a couple of weeks or maybe even months or in between different facilities. But for those kids that are, and really any individual that's moving around to different living situations, it's probably in their best interest to be the most careful, not only for themselves, but transmitting to others. Yeah, I think the, uh, Tatiana, some, some of the issue has to do with trying to really help tenderize the hearts of these kids because uh, the, these young people are not fearful of COVID-19. They, they have, uh, have lives that, that have other things that they're far more afraid of that they have to face every day walking out of that house or even in, in the home, you know, sort of being attacked by one of the other kids. So these, these kids are risk hardened. They are risk hardened. So us telling them about, well, this could happen, this could happen. They face that all the time. I think that, that what, we, what we try to do is to tenderize their hearts. Listen, you don't wanna, you don't wanna get Miss, uh, uh, Miss Gale sick. You know, you, you, you'll probably survive, you know, you're, you're a diesel, but, but Miss Gale, you're the worker, you know, she's, she's older and, you know, you, don't you like her? And can, can we see about protecting her or for kids who are, who are going back Home, perhaps you don't want to get abuelita sick. You don't want to get Nana and Papa sick. So we have to we have to approach it in a whole different kind of way. Thank you so I, much, Professor. Go ahead. I completely agree with that, and I, I would also say from personal experience, kids that I have in foster care, and not necessarily just in group homes, but those that have visitations. You know, that is something that for a lot of people look forward to. A lot of our patients are looking forward to reconnecting with their families and have had to wait for a really long time. I'm talking weeks to months yeah. before they're actually cleared to continue their visitations. And so taking that into account, and again, leveraging, like you're saying, um, is super important. Finding where they're at, but truly having those real conversations with patients. Again, we're asking a lot of our foster youth. And so um, it's slightly different dynamics than you might see in a, in a non-foster situation. Absolutely, I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Thank you both so much. I also, um, we've gotten a number of questions about whether foster caregivers will be prioritized among childcare workers. I just wanted to speak to that briefly that the California Department of Public Health has described um, you know, eligibility um, on their website. We do know that here in LA County, uh, foster caregivers who are not providing care for those outside of their household are unlikely to be considered eligible at this time. Um, that's again, if they are not eligible because of their age or eligible because of another category, they are not eligible at this time in LA County uh, simply by virtue of their status as a foster caregiver. There is some advocacy uh, happening across the state around changing this, but at this time, being a foster caregiver alone is not um, prioritized for receiving the vaccine. There are also questions about whether caregivers will be required to take the vaccine in order to get approval. At this time, per LA County Department of Public Health, there is no mandatory vaccination requirement from local, state, or federal government. However, we all hope that once uh, individuals find out how safe and effective the vaccine is, that they will voluntary, voluntarily receive it. Dr. Ghislaine touched on many of the issues relating to uh, children and youth and when they are eligible for the vaccine. And just to, again, emphasize, uh, starting March 15th, 
healthcare providers may use their clinical judgment to vaccinate individuals ages 16 to 64 who are at high risk for morbidi morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 as a result of a severe health condition. So for our medically fragile children uh, who are 16 and up, they may qualify on that basis. And I expect that more guidance will be coming out from the state to address that issue. Uh, lastly, we just really want to emphasize, particularly for our, our caregivers, relative caregivers in particular, who um, may um, be undocumented, that uh, the vaccine is being given to LA County residents at no cost, regardless of immigration status. Uh, your immigration status should not be asked of you and these caregivers should be able to receive the vaccination, assuming they meet the other criteria to do so, regardless of immigration status. And, and immigration status should at no time be requested or reported to immigration. And again, Medi-Cal for a caregiver who otherwise qualifies for the vaccine uh, is not required. So those are a few of the final questions that we received from our guests that uh, we received guidance from the LA County Department of Public Health around and just wanted to share those answers with all of you. Uh, we have a number of other questions that came in both prior to the talk, during the talk, and we will attempt to answer them uh, on a handout that we will be submitting uh, to all of our guests and sharing on our social media after this event. I'd like to take the question that uh, Professor Lucas Wright has. Uh, actually, this isn't a question. This is some information that I think is gonna help um, all communities. Uh, so the, the Department of Public Health has, has uh, seen uh, as a result of geo mapping that the numbers of vaccines given in South Los Angeles is far less than in other, in other areas and that there are uh, folk coming from other areas to sort of take those, uh, 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 those um, <coughs> excuse me, those appointments uh, that could have been used in South LA their folk are sort of flooding into South Los Angeles to to be taken. So because what they did was they took a look at the uh, the zip code from that person that came and they were out outside of South LA. And so what has happened is uh, Department of Public Services is is partnering with some of us to mobilize a large cadre of faith centers church, churches to conduct the vaccines. And what we are doing as opposed to utilizing the um, electronic portal, because that is just not working for many people. Some folks can't, I, I, I can't tell you the number of people that cannot afford their Wi-Fi anymore. So kids are dropping out of school, having to drop out because they cannot go online to get in school. So we know then that those who are in the home also cannot uh, 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 get into these portals to, to make these, these uh, uh, appointments. So we have been allowed to do old school paper and pen and calling people. And that's going to be very helpful because when we can call into those homes and speak with the, the African-American and Latinx population and, and they can ask us questions like, is it safe? Is, is somebody going to report me? That kind of thing. We can pr provide a layer of safety and a layer of trust that will move the needle on uh, uh, vaccine uptake, I do believe strongly. And so we are creating a, a large uh, uh, a network of, 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 of faith centers, the iglesias, the, uh, the temples, the, uh, the churches, uh, all of those, uh, the Catholic, the Catholic uh, churches as well, across, uh, all across uh, the, the African-American and Latino population. So we're pulling them all in and, we're, we're, and we have a cadre of folk who are going to train churches on how to do this. And so that we can increase the uptake uh, considerably. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. That is so helpful to know. And we do know, and I think we have some friends from the Foster Faith Family Network joining us today. Uh, so hopefully there's some connection there to the foster care community. I really want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, for your extraordinary contributions to this conversation today. We've received amazing feedback in the chat and already via email uh, from folks thanking you for your participation. Um, we really can't thank you enough for shedding light on this important issue uh, through the lens of uh, race and foster care. It is incredibly meaningful to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To our participants, we'd like to hear from you about your thoughts on today's event. I've put a survey into the chat 
please complete it and please uh, let us know if you have other questions that we can help answer on these issues. You can also contact me via email uh, and follow us on social media for more regular updates from the UCLA Pritzker Center. In closing, I just wanted to say that a lot of you have asked about advocacy for foster families and children in care during this time. Uh, please, again, complete the survey. Let us know if you'd like to get involved in that, and we're happy to reach out to you with further information. We have recorded this event. It will be posted live. Uh, excuse me. It will be posted on our social media and shared on our YouTube account at UCLA Pritzker next week. And we just really want to thank you all for being here. Again, thank you so much to, uh, to all of our panelists. And uh, with that, I believe that our panel is complete for the day. Thank you again to all for participating.